Nuclear fusion is often seen as the holy grail of clean, safe energy. A fusion reactor cannot melt down or fail in a way that poses a significant threat to the population. The waste it produces is by and large non-toxic. The fuel is functionally limitless. It's just a slow, methodical process to refine the technology needed to reach this level. But what if there was a way to produce more energy than consumed, right now and in a big way? Such a way does exist, and we could do it, it would just require making some sacrifices to the list of benefits. Instead of trying to contain the reaction, we let it out to play. To get to the topic at hand, let's explore some quick background. Nuclear energy has a long history, starting from the discovery of uranium in 1789 by Martin Kleproth, to the discovery of ionizing radiation by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895 when he was able to produce X-rays. By this point, humanity had no idea the direction we were going with this knowledge. We just knew that some materials emitted energy. In 1896, Henry Becquerel found that pitchblende also emitted something that darkened photographic plates. He discovered alpha and beta radiation. Helium nuclei and electrons respectively being kicked off at high speeds. Paul Villard then discovered gamma radiation coming from pitchblende. It wasn't a particle, it was more like the previously discovered X-rays. 1896 was also when Pierre and Marie Curie finally gave the phenomenon its name we know today, radioactivity. In 1938, fission was conclusively discovered by chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. It would seem that atoms of certain heavy elements could be broken into lighter elements, with energy being produced in large amounts. More accurately, some of the mass is converted into energy in the form of ionizing radiation. In 1939, Francis Purin introduced the concept that a critical mass of uranium could, in theory, produce a self-sustaining energy release. We had not yet developed a firm grasp of the details surrounding atomic theory, but now we had just enough knowledge to put two and two together and come up with something interesting. Through scientific curiosity, we stumbled upon a Pandora's box hidden in the numbers. Like the myth, this metaphorical box contained hope, hope for limitless energy that could power the world. But the hope was quickly set aside because, like the myth, the box also contained misfortune. The first atomic bombs purely used fission, containing a core of uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Pure fission weapons are powerful, but have practical limits in size, power, and cost. Later, boosting was developed. Adding small amounts of fusion fuels, such as deuterium-tritium mixes, increased the yields. Next came the thermonuclear weapons, bombs that did not suffer the same limitations of pure fission. In theory, a thermonuclear bomb could be made arbitrarily large. Using a fission first stage, the atomic bomb is used to kickstart a fusion reaction in a second stage, allowing for more energy produced and more uranium to undergo fission. Developed by Edward Teller and Stanislav Ulam, this became the first time humanity was able to wield fusion energy. Our story will now take a hard left turn from the usual course of these stories, and will circle back to energy. Shortly after developing nuclear weapons, many of the scientists who did so felt bad about it, except for Edward Teller. This was a fairly common occurrence in both the US and Soviet Union. Turns out, building death machines that can end human civilization are all fun and games in the lab, but once you go watch one erase an entire island, you start to feel like maybe you shouldn't have. Except Edward Teller. So along with the, uh, primary application, there was also other uses for them being explored. Such as massive Earth-moving projects, space travel, and, oddly enough, energy production. In the 1970s, there was a few passing studies that postulated the idea of using small thermonuclear bombs as an energy source. The idea was actually pretty simple. You drill a very deep shaft, drop a small hydrogen bomb down, set it off, and then you use a heat exchanger to heat molten salts from the now hot subsurface rock to produce energy. In theory, this would result in generating much more energy than was put in to produce electricity from fusion. If you just ignore the other issues with the concept. 
Other proposals of the idea called for just using pure fission weapons at low yields. And one proposal using a giant spherical chamber buried in the ground where a kiloton yield bomblets would be detonated every 45 minutes. The heated cavity would heat molten salts and it would operate like any other thermal power plant. This concept is basically a nuclear power plant where moderated and controlled fission is not only not required, but it's undesirable. I also can't imagine its efficiency would be anywhere as good, honestly. I tried to find figures on efficiency, but there's not much info on the concept as it was not explored very far, for obvious reasons. So as far as how efficient it would be compared to conventional nuclear energy, I don't know. Whichever technique is looked at, the goal is basically the same, to produce a massive heat reservoir that can be tapped into, operating like a normal geothermal plant just using an artificial heat plume. Such a power plant would need to be used in a geologically stable area, one where there's less risk of radiological leaching and one free of earthquakes. A few ideas were to use salt domes or deep granite deposits. This makes nuclear geothermal location specific in a way much like normal geothermal, which kind of negates the point. It's better to just use conventional nuclear plants in a controlled setting. They aren't site-specific, and can be made very safe. Unlike a nuclear bomb plant that, by its design, would not be terribly safe. The risk of underground detonations and the understandable public outcry of such a system also makes it more of a historical curiosity. It's not hard to see why the idea didn't get very far.